Hello, everyone. As he said, I'm Owen O'Malley. I'm a co-founder of Cloudera, as strange as that is for me to say, but I'm very happy to be here. I apologize if I'm a little jet lagged. At least I got in on Saturday instead of last yesterday. So Iceberg is a new podling that came into the Apache incubator this year. And it came out of Netflix, and it came out of their production use case. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to talk about a use case and why Netflix came up with Iceberg to start with. Then I'm going to talk about some of the restrictions on the Hive tables that everyone uses today, what Iceberg does instead, and then how to get started. So Iceberg really came out of the performance out of S3. Now, there's some other characteristics of S3 that are also very important, but fundamentally came out of performance. And so they have huge amounts of data at Netflix, of course. They are continually keeping data on everything that you watch, and um, so they need to analyze that because Netflix is a data-driven business. They need to know what people are watching and who's watching what. So they run these queries a lot, and this is a time series. They've got one month of data is 2.7 million files, um, and they couldn't process more than a few days. So then the query it looks like that, where you are selecting um, distinct tags from a range of, uh, of dates. So when they ran it on Hive, they got 400,000 splits right? Those are individual units of work. And the explained query, just doing the planning, took nine and a half minutes. That's a long time, but it's not unheard of. And when they replaced it with Iceberg, they got it down to 15,000 uh, splits. And the whole thing ran in 13 minutes. Granted, it was 61 hours of cumulative task time, but the wall time was 13 minutes, and it only took 10 seconds of planning. Now, with the file formats, you can do more work up front and figure out that you don't need to run as many tasks. And so if they turn that on on Iceberg, they could spend more time planning, and as a matter of fact, 25 seconds planning, but then the wall clock time got down to 42 seconds. So that is why they wanted Iceberg. They wanted to get the performance. So what is a table format? The first question that everyone thinks is that, is it a file format? And the answer is absolutely no. <laughs> you actually, even when you're using Iceberg, are still storing your data in your Avro, Parquet, or Orc files as you are now. And what the table format is, is actually a layer of abstraction in between. It's how you are organizing those files so that you get them grouped up into a table so that you can do planning quickly and uh, run your uh, job quickly. So what would a good table format be? First of all, it would be specified, because you really want to be able to lay out your data once and then use it for a lot of different execution engines. You want to use the same data with Hive, with Spark, with Presto. Right? with all of them together, and you want it to be well-defined what goes where. It should support atomic changes. Now, part of the NoSQL world has always been, we don't need transactions. Well, we found out that wasn't actually true. We actually do want to be able to change the data and be able to mutate it with getting consistent results with people um, seeing the same results based on and consistent results based on when they start the query. We also need schema evolution. If you've got your data that's been accumulating over years, almost guaranteed that you're going to need to change the columns that you have in that data. You're going to add columns. You're going to delete columns. Sometimes you don't even know the types you're going to end up with. But in any case, you want to make sure that it supports the evolution of those types and moves forward. And you finally need to enable efficient access. There's 
all the storage formats at this point support predicate pushdown. That means that the query execution engines actually tell the, the loader when it's reading a file, OK, I only need rows that satisfy particular predicates. So for example, if you're searching uh, for a particular time range, you actually push those predicates down into the reader so that it can just read the parts of the file that are needed for that particular query. <clears throat> Additional features, it's really, really good if it's a solid abstraction and doesn't leak the details out to the um, upper levels. And you want to be able to evolve that layout over time. OK, now let me talk about where are the current state of affairs. When Hive was first getting written by Facebook, they actually came up with some really nice structures that were similar to some ones that actually the, the guy who started it um, saw at Yahoo. And so basically, they create directories based on particular values of, of particular columns. So for example, this is a table that's sorted first, or broken down first by date, and then by hour within the date. Um, in general, I wouldn't recommend breaking down by hour, because if you do the math, you quickly end up with a lot of partitions very quickly. Hive doesn't do well if you do that. But certainly by day makes a lot of sense. Um, and then within, down at the bottom, you have the files that the individual tasks wrote. So here you can see that the important characteristics are you've got a directory structure. You kind of need to tra traverse the tra directory structure to see what data you have. And then the data is actually down at the leaves. Now, when you want to do a filter, Hive actually does the first level of filtering by only reading the directories that uh, can match the predicate. So, for example, if you only needed the 19th hour out of that date, then you could just go to that directory, uh, nested directory, and pull out the data that you need. Now, that works. But um, now you need to know where are the partitions. So Hive keeps a meta store, and it tracks the information about the, the partitions that you have. It also tracks the schema information and how your types have changed over time. And it tracks some st table statistics. Now, it allows you to filter um, by partition values, but there's a really big caveat there. It'll filter on the client side, um, and it won't filter on the database side unless your predicate, uh, your partition column is a string type. Um, it uses that external SQL database, which is kind of annoying in the cloud. And um, the file system is the only place that the individual files are, are tracked. And there's no way to add the per file statistics into the system. Now, a few years ago, those of us at Hortonworks were like, OK, Hive's structure is OK. That, that works for us. But we want to be able to support ACID transactions on our data. And so we started implementing a, and implemented a Hive um, ACID layout, as it's called. And so we left the partition structure the same, and in, we added bucket files and delta files so that you could do insert, updates, and deletes, all with snapshot isolation from each other. That was really, really handy for our users, and it's been very well received. However, not everything is a happy thing in Hiveland. First, the partitions are only in the meta store, and the files are in the file system. So now you have to look two places in order to plan your query. The bucketing is defined by Java's uh, Hive implementation, or sorry, Hive's Java implementation of the hash. And so if you don't lay things out using that hash function, now all of a sudden, when Hive tries to read it, it will make bad assumptions and won't find your data. Right? You can get incorrect results. And so that leads to people doing things like saying, OK, Spark can read Hive data, but it can't write to it. And 
that blows away one of Hadoop's ecosystem's really big strengths, which is you can read your data the way that you want to read it for this particular query. Another addition or problem until we added the ACID layout was that the only atomic operation you had was adding a new partition. That's why you often see people doing hourly partitions is because that was the only operation that you could do atomically. You could write all the files and then add it into the meta store and that worked. Any other combination didn't work. Deleting a partition, adding files to a partition, all of those would lead to uh, race conditions on reading the data. And it required um, a directory listing per partition. So that is pretty painful in HDFS, although it's okay. Where that's really problematic is the cloud object stores. That's exactly why the Hive query planning was taking so long. It's because it's trying to do those directory listings in S3. S3 has another problem. Actually, it's got two other problems that, that matter here. The, another, the second one is that its directories are eventually consistent. Your task can write a file into S3, get back the response saying it's done. If you look, you'll see it. But some other task on a different computer can look and sometimes it'll see it, sometimes it won't see it. Now, eventually it'll always see it, but it's that eventually part that becomes really problematic because if your table is missing some of its data, that's not just unfortunate, that's wrong results and you can get in big trouble for your business by missing data. <clears throat> The third problem actually is that uh, the directory layout in S3 creates hotspots that are really hard to work around. <clears throat> there are also some less obvious problems. The first is that because all of the partition values are being stringified, some of the cases like null get translated to this crazy hive default partition thing. If you've ever seen that, that's because your partition value had a null value in it. Another one is that the file or the statistics become stale. So it's possible to get incorrect results based on the stale information in the Hive meta store and not even know it. The other, uh, an additional concern is that the um, Hive table layouts are continually evolving and they're not documented anywhere, right? If you need to find out the details of the Hive acid, format, you end up looking at code, or asking someone who knows, but mostly you end up looking at code. And finally, the bucket definition is tied to Hive code. Other annoyances, you need to know how that data is laid out, right? You need to know that if you just say timestamp greater than X, you're going to be doing a table scan. If you end up wanting to do, where instead of that, you probably meant to say, the timestamp is bigger than X and the condition on the day. Once you do that, then you can get partition pruning. But until you do that, you aren't going to get it. You're just going to do a whole table scan. Another annoyance is that the scheme evolution in Hive is defined by the file format. So CSV, it doesn't do anything. Everything is, is position-based. Parquet and Orc will do it by name, and so you get more flexibility. Um, actually, Avro and Orc. Parquet mostly does it by position still. Um, then you also have additional problems like which formats support decimal, which ones uh, support maps with struct keys, and so on. So, now, as I said, Iceberg came out of Netflix, and so I've done some work on Iceberg, but Mostly I was their champion getting into uh, Apache Incubator. Um, now, Iceberg's design was basically that, okay, instead of using the Hive Metastore, we're going to keep a track of all the files in S3. And so it keeps track of the list of files over time, and every write produces a new snapshot. So that gives us the ability to do this, where Readers use the current snapshot, writers are writing a new snapshot, and as time goes forward, you get a series of these histories of 
showing which files are being included in the table and which ones aren't. So any change is an atomic operation, whether you're appending new data or merging or rewriting files. In reality, it gets a little more complicated than that. <laughs> so in particular, um, Iceberg implements, um, it tracks the schema, the, the partition layout, and uh, the properties of each of your, your files. And it tracks the old snapshots for garbage collection because it, you need to know when you can delete those old ones. Each metadata file is itself immutable, but it allows us to keep track of more metadata about each of those files. And so it's a copy on write system, so you never can rewrite the old data. You just make a new copy with the updated information and move it forward. And of course, you can roll back if things go badly. Now, you don't want to rewrite those snapshots every single time. And so Iceberg doesn't make you do that. It divides snapshots into manifest files. And those manifest files contain the directory listings themselves. And so they um, can store data across many partitions, and you can reuse them across snapshots. So in this example, M01 and 2 are manifest files. Version 1, um, or snapshot 1, is using uh, M0 and M1, or sorry, M0. S2 added uh, M0 and M1. And then S3 replaced them both with S with M2. So you can use those to to reuse parts of your table. If you're just adding new stuff, it's easy to add a new manifest. You don't have to rewrite the old manifest. You just need to uh, write a new manifest and add it into your snapshot. So it cuts down on the write amplification that you're having to do. So what goes into them? All, the list of all the files, uh, iceberg tracking data. It also lets you track the partition values and the per column upper and lower bounds so that you can do partition pruning and actually even bucket pruning based on just the contents of the manifest. And it also gives you uh, row count sizes, null counts, a lot of extra detail that the optimizers want in order to be able to operate efficiently on the data itself so that you can get much better query optimization without actually looking at the files. You just look, need to look at the manifest. OK, so how do you update these things? The, you start by doing um, a commit. And the commit will um, need to take the current version create a new metadata version and manifest files and atomically swap them. So how do you do it? Do that. The easiest way is to use the database to actually point to where the root is. Or you can actually do atomic rename if you're in HDFS. Um, the atomic swap actually guarantees linear history. And um, yeah. So. Iceberg goes on the assumption that everything will work by default um, and that you, no one else is writing to the table. That's true in the vast majority of cases. Now, if you get unlucky and someone else is operating on the table, it actually will detect the conflict and force the operation to retry with the newer metadata. So you basically need to keep your... Uh, the code keeps the assumptions about what state the query was in, what it updated, and then looks for conflicts, assuming everything is good. So for example, if your input, if you were just trying to merge several small files, you could be merging two small Avro files and replacing them with a parquet file. That one would be fine as long as none of those three files were getting deleted. Um, now. If you, someone did delete it, one of those files, then you would need to retry again and redo the operation with the updated state. So what does that mean? That means that now we are in a state where we don't need to do the directory listings. 
right? If you're in S3, Iceberg can operate without accessing any of the data at all, and, um, or rather, <laughs> sorry. It's, Iceberg can operate without doing any S3 directory listings at all. That really is a huge speed up and means that you're guaranteed to get consistent operations. You also get to avoid the prefix op problem where the, the path operators try to open the files directly um, in place. And so they get overloaded, the S3 servers. Um, so you never are renaming things. Everything's right in place. That makes life much, much better. Um, and you get faster planning, right? You do one, one set of manifest reads, and you don't have to do any of the directory listings. Um, now, one of the advantage of that is that because now your partitions can be smaller, you can actually get more pruning, right? Because the Hive Metastore was your limit on how much scale out you could have on this data. Now you can actually go through and have smaller partitions and get away with it. Another hidden feature is that because as part of the Iceberg's design, you can treat the bucketing as very similar to partitions. So you can actually get bucket pruning and only look at the buckets that are relevant for your particular query. So that gives you a whole nother set of operations that you can push down that let you read fewer and fewer files, which is exactly how you get the speed up. Finally, you, in, uh, when you're using Hive formats, you have your choice. If you do a blind split, you're just randomly cutting files at HDFS boundaries or uh, picking random spots in an S3 blob. With Iceberg, you actually record where the logical divisions are in the file. So you can actually make specific splits and say, I'm going to cut it this offset, that offset, because I know how much data is there and where those points are. So you don't need to, um, to do the random probing. You can use exactly the correct split and um, find out where those uh, cut points are. Another characteristic is that it actually defines what the valid scheme evolution is, right? So you can add, drop, rename, or reorder columns. It actually does that by assigning IDs for the columns inside. So you don't need to worry about the IDs, but that lets you rename things and keep the scheme evolution alone. I recently had a customer that in Hive, actually they were in the middle of switching from Hive to Spark, which is a whole nother set of issues, but, but that's what they were doing. And in Hive it actually worked because uh, they basically took some org files and just dumped them into a table. It wasn't great, it wasn't good, but it worked. Now the unfortunate thing is they used the wrong names for the columns. Again, Hive, they got lucky, and it did the right thing because of the version of Hive that they were using. When they switched to Spark, now because Spark had a, a different code path, it said, oh, the columns that I'm looking for aren't there. I'll give you nulls for everything. So they basically were getting nulls out of their data. And that all came about because the different execution engines, Hive and Spark, were doing different kinds of schema evolution, and so it didn't play well together. With Iceberg, they defined one set of rules, and so now all the execution engines will get the same schema evolution across the different platforms. It also standardizes the date and time characteristics. The timestamp, okay, how many of you guys know what a mess Hadoop is with timestamps? <laughs> Only a few of you. More of you should be aware of just how messed up they are. My favorite is that I was talking to the Parquet team, 
And the parquet, depending on whether you're running from Spark, Impala, or Hive, has completely different semantics for timestamp. And they can't tell which one wrote it, so they can't tell how to undo the semantics. It's awesome. And then they were trying to get Hive to change its semantics so that the semantics of timestamp in Hive would change depending on which file format they were storing in. I'm like, no, no, bad idea. Don't do that. So we talked them off that cliff. But, but Iceberg standardizing the timestamp stuff is, is really good stuff. We need that. Um, and actually, it even pushed Orc to do a little bit better. Um, getting consistent support for decimals is also a really big deal. Um, and of course, it's got to support the, the complicated types because, of course, you guys are all denormalizing your data, as you should for the big data stuff. Um, it also supports hidden partitioning. Another feature of Iceberg's partitioning that's really handy is it's not hierarchical. So if you have things split up by uh, product and split up by uh, country, in Hive, you'd have to pick one of those to be the first level of the directory and the other one to be subordinate to it. In Iceberg, they actually can be independent, so you can choose whichever order you want, and they'll both be uh, available for predicate pushdown, regardless of uh, which order they uh, would be in ordered in Hive. Um, and finally, you get the, the mixed file support and reliable metrics. Because the metrics are reliable in Iceberg precisely because they're getting updated along with writing the data into Iceberg. So it's not two steps like it is in Hive. You write the data, and part of that update is exactly updating the statistics. OK, so what have we done in the other projects? Um, Ryan Blue from Netflix has been working a lot on the data source v2 for Spark, um, trying to get more logical plans and behaviors. In work, we needed to add additional statistics, and we actually are adding timestamp with local time zone uh, because we only had timestamp instant or timestamp uh, the local timestamp uh, and Parquet. And Avro improvements are getting column resolution by ID and a new materialization API. So how do you get started with Iceberg? About six months ago at the beginning of the year, um, I talked the Facebook guy, or sorry, the Netflix guys into contributing it to Apache. So that's now an Apache podling. Um, so you can go to Apache Incubator and pick up the code. You contribute it just like any other Apache project, complete with GitHub issues and pull requests. Um, by the way, it's been great having Apache actually support GitHub issues and pull requests. I don't know about you guys, but whenever I go back to Hive and have to deal with Jira and downloading the issues off of there, I'm like, oh, really? So painful. But, oh well. <laughs> so the supported engines, Spark is supported, Presto is supported. Someone did read-only support for Pig. And um, you can uh, go to the dev list and ask lots of questions. Um, so what's some of the future work? Some of the future work is integration with Hive. Um, Netflix doesn't use Hive very much, so they didn't start with that. Um, there's a Python library. There's Arrow support. Um, so they, actually, that's part of the Python support. And actually, one of the, the big pieces that has been lighting up the, the dev list recently is dealing with Delta files. Now, when I first read the... the um, the spec for Iceberg, I was like, oh, it's pretty clear you want Delta files here, right? Because we'd already done Hive Acid, and we are like, of course you want Delta files to be in here. And so now we're going through and, and formalizing that, actually. Um, 
there are some big companies that very much want that. And so it'll take the form of probably two pieces. One with um, the most important one is to have natural keys. So if you've got a table that's sorted on your primary key, you want to take updates based on that primary key and guarantee uniqueness in that primary key. So you basically will record new versions saying, hey, that key out of that file is no longer there, and it gets replaced with this new version from the, the updated file. Um, there will also be support for uh, artificial keys, so that if you get updates, you can delete them if your t table doesn't have natural keys. OK, so that's my presentation. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, Owen. Let me hand over the mic. Let's wait a second. Oh, we recorded it, too. Um, quick question. Uh, Performance-wise for writing, um, you mentioned a lot about reading. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like it's going to do a bit more computation than, for example, maybe Spark on Hive with all this intelligent bucketing and things. Is it comparable? What's the sort of situation there? It's actually pretty comparable. It's, it's not that much more on the right load. It's a little bit more because you're updating the S3 blob with the, the results. But assuming you don't have contention for writing the same files, it's pretty comparable. And, and on that note, does it suit larger writes or lo lots of small writes, or is it does it sort of favor one or the other? Um, wait, I'm so, sorry. So if, you, if you're trickling in data row by row, is it going to sort of generate <laughs> okay. overheads? So this is absolutely not going to be super great for the case where you're trickling data in a few rows at a time, right? This isn't going to be the way you implement your online database. <laughs> That's not the intent here. The intent here is, yes, you can delete records. You know, for GDPR, it's great. <laughs> um, if you want to um, insert new, rec new partitions, that's great. But you're much better off inserting things a million rows at a time than a few rows at a time. So you can do a few rows, but not millions of times in a second. Cool, thanks. Sure. Oh. Yeah, hand it over there, and then we have a third. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, do you have an opinion on the recently open source Delta Lake, and how would you compare it to Iceberg? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the first thing about Delta is that it's Apache licensed but it's a Databricks thing. And so what that means is that, just like Isabel was talking about, it's not open governance. If you want to contribute to Delta, it is, um, you're going to have to contribute your code to Databricks, right? It's not like you're giving it to a, a open source Apache project. You're giving it to Databricks. If they decide to relicense it, that's up to them. Um, so you're basically giving work to Databricks. That doesn't make, give me warm fuzzies. Um, but it depends what you're, you're looking for. Other interesting bits out of Databricks, Delta um, is, um, it looks like, according to their own documentation, that you only get atomicity if you're using HDFS. You don't get it out of cloud stores. So I've only looked a bit at it. I've, I'll give that disclaimer. But those are the two things that, that bother me about. And I can see that I suspect that Delta um, got released that way precisely because they don't want the cloud providers shipping it. Right, okay. next question. Uh, hi, thanks for the presentation. Actually, that was my question, but uh, also around Hoodie. That's Apache, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually haven't looked as much at Hoodie. Um, Hoodie, you kind of, oh, sorry. Hoodie is an Apache project that came out of Uber. Um, Uber definitely seems to be developing their own ecosystem of a bunch of different pieces. 
and I just haven't looked at it as much. I know Ryan has. Ryan, Ryan Blue is the, the, one who, the guy who started Iceberg. Um, so he, he's talked to them a fair amount, but I haven't. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I have a complimentary question, sorry. <laughs> Uh, it was not clear for me how can I integrate this into a different framework. Like, let's think I want to write a connector for Flink. Uh, is this, the, the APIs are, are stable because it's, this is like a world protocol. It's absolutely possible. I mean, the, 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 the new ones are getting added. Um, for example, the, the, the pig one was contributed as well as the Presto one. Um, the APIs are reasonably stable. It's still a young podling, so it's, they're not super stable, but absolutely adapters for Flink would be awesome. All right. Um, I, have a <laughs> I have a question again. A follow on on Hoodie. So, um, just a little bit of meat on the bones there. So um, Hoodie was kind of came from a different background kind of to support machine learning pipelines as well. So this notion of um, being able to do what they call time travel to make a query on, on what was the value of this row mm -hmm. with this primary key at this point in time, and also data validation. So as you're ingesting data into the system, to be able to have a, a scheme or some rules in which to validate it. Is that on the roadmap, or so where are you? Time travel is, is on the roadmap um, because the snapshots give that to you very, very easily, right? It's easy to, to travel through time. Um, I guess, what are you looking for in terms of the validation? Your data has a schema. Ah. <laughs> so your data has a schema, but you don't know. So in machine learning, all data is numeric, pretty much. So your schema is FP32. Uh, and even your categorical variables will be FP32. But you want to know ranges, valid ranges. Mm -hmm. So typically, that's a problem in pipelines, because you have to know if the value is outside the range, if it's an anomaly. and. You might want to write, a, you know, you could write a map, a filter, you know, but you know, having so, some support for doing that. So all makes of it li life easier. the the min and max of each column is automatically computed, mm. so and stored in the the manifest. Mm. So it'd be easy to get mm. ranges out. Mm. Um, so th this is in TFX, so TensorFlow pipelines, and and uh, there's also uh, an Amazon project called DoP. I think it was developed here in Berlin, actually. <laughs> do that. Okay. Okay. Oh, just a note for the time travel. I guess that's just the absence of garbage collection. If you don't, all oh, right, sure. Uh, let's take one last question here, and then we'll wrap up. Right. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, is about migration. So let's say you have a, a system now where you Spark mm -hmm. uh, writing uh, Hive layout. So how would you migrate to using uh, both producing and consuming using Iceberg? That's a good question. I don't have a good answer. Um, <laughs> I suspect that the way that, I mean, like I said, the Hive integration isn't very plugged together yet. It's, it's in progress, but, but it's not plugged together. What I suspect will end up happening is that you'll end up saying, this is an iceberg table, that's a Hive table, and then migrating. I don't think you're going to be able to, to have one table that's both iceberg and Hive at the same time. Right, okay, thanks. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks, Owen. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again.